the scene is Holland, Massachusetts in the early 1960s. Rick was born to Dick and Judy. Unfortunately, during Judy's pregnancy, there was a lack of oxygen being transmitted to Rick during his birth. And Rick was born with cerebral palsy, a condition that affects um, muscle control and movement. He was a quadriplegic, unable to speak, walk, or use his hands. Doctors gave his parents the advice to institutionalize Rick because they believed he would always be in a vegetative state and there would be no hope of him functioning in the real world and in society. But his parents refused to accept that bleak diagnosis. They noticed something in Rick's eyes that would follow them around in the room. And they were convinced that their son was intelligent and aware he was just locked inside of a body that wouldn't cooperate. They began a journey to give their son a voice in a normal life. Their love and determination led them to commission a group of engineers at Tufts University. And they wanted the group to develop a computer that Rick could use to communicate. And so they created this computer system that would allow him to communicate with the world, the world by using his head to select letters on a screen. And as they were getting ready for Rick to use this for the very first time, his mother and father were anticipating what would be his first words. Judy thought it would be mom. Dick thought it would be dad. To both of their surprise, Rick's first words were, go Bruins. <laughs> the, NH the NHL hockey team from Boston. They realized that Rick was not just aware, but he had keen interests, specifically in sports. The the, there, was a, there was an opportunity to do a charity run for a local lacrosse player who'd been who'd been paralyzed in an accident. And Rick asked his father if they could participate. His dad wanting to make his young son, this young man feel inspired, agreed to go on the run. It was an extraordinary beginning to a brand new journey for them. With a makeshift carrier and wheelchair, Dick pushed his son for the entire five mile race. And when they crossed the finish line, Rick typed this. Dad, when you were running, it felt like I wasn't disabled anymore. That moment sparked a father's determination to give his son the feeling of freedom and normality as much as he could. So over the next decade, watch this, Team Hoyt, as they became known, competed in over 1,000 races including marathons, triathlons, and even Ironman competitions. Father and son competed together. Dad pushed, biked, carried, and swam, all while inspiring people all over the world with their unyielding spirit, love, and dedication. This family produced something that many of us have observed. And each of our families have the power to produce meaningful values and contributions to society. And I want us to look at those. The bedrock of our faith really is well stated by Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, and this is what he says. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall. Why didn't it fall? Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. It's interesting that 
Today, in the modern world, if individuals want to destroy a high-rise building, they start at the foundation and at the center. And they, engineers know that if the foundation and center is compromised, even the most sturdy of buildings cannot withstand the pressures that they were designed to if the foundation falters. This is what I want you to view in this conversation, as your family is the foundation. And if your family falls, everything else falls around you. Jesus makes it clear that he and his words must be the center. Not just lip service, not just empty gesture, not just a culture Christian, but a person who runs all of their thoughts and ideas and suggestions through the matrix of God's word. You'll notice he emphasizes his word. If you hear my word and do them, hear them and do them. If we ever get away from making Jesus the center, there will eventually be a collapse. No matter how strong your structure is in your family, no matter how moral it is, um, it doesn't matter. If Jesus is not the center, it will fall. Family needs to be one of the things that we strengthen. Now, I want to say this because I know there are a room full of people here and watching online who fall into various categories. Some of you are young. And you haven't had a family yet, but you're the product of a family, positive or negative, or maybe even neutral. Some of you have young families, children that you're raising, and depending on how long you've been doing it, you've been wanting some help, someone to come alongside you and give you a framework of what to focus on. That's what I hope today does. Some of us have raised a family, and now our family is starting a family. And if you're anything like me, you might have regrets about ways in which you wish you would have done it. Um, no matter what category you're in, this is what I want you to think about. I don't want you to focus on your past. Not today. That's for another time. What I want you to focus on is your present and your future. Because all of us have regrets. All of us have things we wish we would have done differently. Today, I want you to consider not what could have been done different, but what can be done different going forward. The other thing that I've said that is worth repeating is I really would like for us to not be victims of our past family experience. All of us probably have some form of trauma on varying levels. But without minimizing the hurt and the pain that has occurred, may I just encourage you to, just for a moment, let that person who wronged you not be the center of attention. Let Jesus be the center of attention. Let what he can do moving forward be greater than what they did in the past. And I want to say that without minimizing the hurt, the pain, the trauma, that's very real for people. But can I say something to you in a loving way? I think I can, and I would like to. Please stop letting your parents be the scapegoat for your future. Please stop letting your past family experiences shackle you and prevent you from stepping into what God has next for you. Because his power is so much greater than our past. And so, with that being said, I want to show you the, the foundation of family in our life. The family is the first form of society established in human history. Of all the institutions created by God, family was first before the church, before government, before anything. It was the prototype, if you will, for society. What happens in the house was the beginning and the, the best idea of what should happen in a social setting, in society. In other words, society is a reflection of the condition of the family. When you, when you begin to complain about society, when I begin to complain about society, what I'm really identifying is the family has broken down and it leaks into society. And all society is, is a bunch of individuals who've come from families. 
family's the, the way in which we learn to interact, the way in which to socialize, our, our first run at leadership, our first run at uh, communication, our first run at rules, our, our first run at all of these things. And so society is a reflection of the condition of the family. When you, really, when you blame society, when you blame culture, what you're really doing is blaming family because that, they didn't learn those things in a vacuum. They learned them in a family. Does that make sense to you? And so what you need to understand is the family is not the product of government, legislation, social science, or religion. The family is a product of the creator of the universe. And as long as we do it by his blueprint, I won't say everything will go well for you because stuff will go bad. But the reward is knowing that you relied on the word of the creator to govern your life. This is the blueprint. Have you, um, have you ever driven by a building on your way to work that um, was incomplete? Anybody ever dr driven by like a construction site? And you like, after a while you think, is anything happening there? Ever wondered that? Like, I drove by this building when we were doing this building project and I was able to be inside and I often thought, is anything happening there? <laughs> but I had access to something that normally we don't have access to. I had access to the blueprint. So I knew that even though it didn't look like anything was happening, I knew the HVAC team was working. I knew the electrical contractor was working because I had the, blue, I had the blueprint. Our lack of ability to see the blueprint, it compromises us and causes us to doubt whether God's really at work. Because if you only see the outside, you you miss what God's doing below the surface. And a lot of the really important things, as you know, happens below the surface. There's a lot of really important things below your feet in this room right now. There's a space backstage that you can get to, and there's all kinds of wires and cables and pipes and stuff that if it wasn't there, this wouldn't be here. But we don't, we don't see it. And I think the same is true and our lack of ability to see the blueprints, it causes us to doubt God being at work. We can act like God's not doing anything because we don't see anything. Um, Jesus prays a very powerful prayer in John chapter 17, verse 13 on. I won't get all the way to verse 19 for the sake of time. But here's this prayer. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world. Well, why are you talking to us about this Jesus? I'm saying this so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. He's talking about us in a future sense. And he's saying, I want those who will build their life based on my blueprint, build their life on the rock, not on the sand, on the blueprint. I do this for a reason. He says, because I want them to have joy. So keep that in mind, that Jesus' intention for you is joy. And he says this, I have given them, he's talking to his heavenly father, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Not a very happy thought, is it? But there is joy attached to it. And happiness and joy are two different situations. He says this, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Watch this. Here's why they hate us. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. We're in this world, but we're not of it. That gives us access to a different blueprint. Um, my family immigrated here to, from, uh, immigrated to the United States from Italy in the 50s. And many of you know, many of you know that story. Um, my aunt, who's a little bit older than my mother, uh, my mom's older sister, she met a man and married him, and they were in Italy. She became pregnant with their first child and gave birth to him. His name is Sammy. Sammy was born in the United States, and something interesting occurred for Sammy. Both of his parents were from Italy, but he was born in the United States, so something very interesting was bestowed upon him. It's called dual citizenship. He was a citizen both of the United States because he was born here, and of Italy because that's where his family came from. 
When he turned 18 years old, um, he joined the military. It's a, it's a requirement in Italy for all those who become adults to serve, to serve their country. And Sammy was faced with a decision. Because he had dual citizenship, he had to make a choice. He could either give up his U.S. citizenship or give up his Italian citizenship. He could not serve in the military with both statuses. He had to give up one. So he chose to give up his U.S. citizenship, became an Italian citizen, and served the nation of Italy in the armed services. I tell you that for this reason. You and I have dual citizenship. Once we come into the kingdom of God, we are two different places attached to us. We have a physical location. We have a spiritual location. And the, and the decision about leading family comes down to which citizenship will you lean on most? I'm not asking anyone to rel relinquish their U.S. citizenship naturally, physically. I'm not asking you to do that. But in your mind, are you capable of letting the other world that you're from govern your thoughts, your words, and your actions, or you, will you revert to the world that we live in? In the world, but not of it. That's a very important question for us to consider. Here's the blueprint. Proverbs chapter 24, verses three and four says this, by wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Let me, uh, let, me break this, let me break this down for you. You build a home three ways. You ready? Because we're going to need this to get to the 10 things. We, we're only going to be here until about 2 o'clock, and then we'll be done, all right? Uh, build a home by three things, by getting wisdom, by getting knowledge, and by getting understanding. So that verse describes that for us. We need three things, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Knowledge, this is the accumulation of facts and data that you have learned about or experienced. And, and another, another way to describe that is um, a, an, if you're going to go on a trip, let's say you're going to go to France, it's helpful knowledge to know that Paris is the capital of France. That's knowledge. Understanding, it's the process of making connections between different pieces of knowledge or seeing how they fit into the bigger picture. If you're going to France, it's, 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 it's important to understand what the capital is, to know that, but then understanding is why Paris is the capital and not another city. So it's building on itself. The third one is wisdom, and this is the ability to use, use your knowledge and understanding to make good decisions and sound judgments, knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Let me put it to you this way. He says, this is how rooms are built. This is how rooms are made. This is how a home is built. And God speaks about various types of rooms. Think about your home and how it's decorated. Um, most of us would probably not put a sofa in the middle of our kitchen. Now, you might have it as a side part if it's a a breakfast nook or something, but you really wouldn't put a sofa in place of an island. Some of you seem confused about that. How about this? Um, I don't think you'd put a toilet in the middle of your living room. Some of you still seem confused about that. A stove is a beautiful addition to a kitchen, but it would not be a very good accessory as an end table in your bedroom. It would look ridiculous. Do I need to slow down on that like that? Did that like confuse? Does anyone have a stove as your end table? Like some of you are looking at me like, what's wrong with that? No, no, no. <laughs> Knowledge, understanding, wisdom is how we build our house. And so, knowledge is having the facts, understanding is knowing the how, and wisdom is the application. So, um, We've looked at these items over the past few weeks. Society is only as strong as the family. The purpose of the family is to secure society, so on and so forth. When the family dissolves, society dissolves. We, we, we've looked at all that. And what I want to do is I want to give you 10 things of practical help that the family produces. Um, 10 things that the family produces produces. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I've got five minutes left. How many of you think I could do 10 things in five minutes? All right, let's do it. Here we go. Number one, what the family produces. That's a dare. Here we go. Number one, the family produces responsibility. 
This is where we learn responsibility is in our family. A, a child gets chores. That's responsibility. In our household, now this isn't the gospel. This isn't what the Bible teaches. This was the Pennington way of doing it. We had chores for our kids, and it was not attached to an allowance. We didn't pay an allowance. I felt as though room and board was satisfactory enough for an allowance that they owed us something back in exchange for the goods and services they were receiving. Can I get an amen? Yeah, I didn't have, and, I, and it, this really wasn't like, it wasn't really wisdom that I meant to do. I stumbled upon it. Why? Because I knew and understood I didn't have any money to give them to bribe them to do stuff. So I had to lead with fear and compulsion and coercion and say, this is your job. Do it, right? Responsibility. Now, I am kind of joking, but, but when you see an employee at the fast food restaurant that's not taking responsibility, you know they didn't have it modeled. Now, wait, don't get mad at the kid or the adult or whomever. At least they showed up to work that day, right? But... This is something where we've learned it in our homes, responsibility. The second thing is accountability. When the chore wasn't done, there was a consequence to their lack of action. This is what family produces. And when society dissolves and breaks down, it's the result of families not holding themselves and their children accountable. When people behave as if there are no consequences, what I can tell you is somewhere along the line, someone didn't reinforce the product of accountability in that child's life. I, I, I have extreme grace and patience for kids because kids are the product of what they were trained and taught and shown to be and do. It, they cannot be blamed. Not really, unless they get to the point where they've refused the instruction as an older child, and you can't really make them at that point. So res responsibility, accountability, respect. A family produces respect. The respect that looks someone in the eye, that's attentive when they're talking, that, that still pulls the car over when a funeral procession goes by, like the things, the, the firm handshake, the, the, the respect of the other human being, please, thank you, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, those types of things. Like we adopted that in our family and to this day our kids will still say as adults, yes sir and no sir to me, not out of fear out of respect and honor. Someone says, that's overboard. Fine, that's okay. If you, you have to take all these layers and figure out what you want to apply. But I'll tell you one thing, I do not regret instilling in our kids respect and honor for those who are older than them and further along than them. I like it when my kids, I like it when my kids will stand up and give an, an adult a seat when all the seats have run out. Someone says, that's old-fashioned. No, it's not. It should be new fashion. It's respect. <laughs> uh, like, as an adult, I remember getting up for my grandparents and sitting on the floor so they could have the comfy seat. I didn't learn that on my own. My parents taught me that. We passed that on to our kids. Respect. Communication. Oh, morality. Excuse me. Morality. I got ahead of myself. Morality. What's right and what's wrong. Please, 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 with all respect to teachers and school systems and educators, do not, do not delegate the morality of your family to the education system. Don't do that. They didn't create that child. You did. They're meant to supplement your teaching. Same thing with the church. We're here to supplement what they're learning at home and help you raise them. It's not the teacher's job to raise them. It's not Sunday school's job to raise them. It's not the police department's job to raise them. It's the parents' job to raise them and instill in them what is moral and what is right. Next is communicability, communication. When our kids were young, we stole this from someone, and it was the idea, use your words. Anybody ever use this tool? 
Use your words. What's that mean? Don't break my stuff. Use your words. What's that mean, Pastor Josh? Don't throw stuff. Don't hit things. Use your words to express yourself. Don't express yourself in violence. Don't express yourself in hatred. My, my youngest son, who's here somewhere, uh, he might be actually with some of your kids right now teaching them. So <laughs> he's come a long way. Uh, he and his brother, he and his brother got in a fight one time, and his brother's older than him and was bigger than him. And um, Alex, Jacob took care of it, and in Jacob's mind, the fight was over. But in Alex's mind, there was more fight to give. But Jake wouldn't participate and already handled him, so Alex took it out on the garage wall, broke his own hand, boxer's fracture. Insurance wouldn't cover it because it was self-inflicted and because insurance companies are masters at taking um, premiums and not paying out to, you know, claims. That's how they put their names on buildings and stadiums and stuff, right? They don't, they don't build those things because they're giving away a lot of money, so they wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> and we were stuck on the insurance description. Um, <laughs> Broke his own hand, they wouldn't pay for it. So you know what we made him do? He paid for it. He paid for it. How? He mowed the grass. He weed whacked. I took his money. (laughs) He paid for it. Why? He broke it. He paid for it. Use your words. Communication. That would work for a lot of adults. In here and online. A lot of men would benefit and your whole life will change in your family if you just use your words. And, and I, I, I've had this conversation with men, and I don't know why we're this way, but we seem to be averse to, in, uh, to, we be, seem to, be averse to vulnerability. Angela and I will get in arguments. Shock. The big shock is like 90% of them are her fault. That's like the, that's like the big shock. That's like the big shock. She seems nice and quiet and meek and mild, but boy, she got some fight. You know what I mean? Like, so, no, no, back to the subject. Sorry, Daniel, I do that to you all the time. It's something about Daniel's keys. It just brings out the inner Seinfeld in me. What's the deal with family? No, <laughs> so, anyway, um, <laughs> we'll fight. And when things get out of control, sometimes, not all the time, and don't judge because things get out of control in our household. That's how I know to talk to you guys, because we're all the same. Just the same. Things will get out of hand, and, and she'll ask me this question that we've learned from someone else. She'll say, Josh, what's the story you're telling yourself in your head? What's the story you're telling yourself? What, and then I go into that. I'm not going to do that here because this is not therapy. But I, I like tell her what's going on in my brain. She's like, oh, that's not what I meant at all. Use your words. I was telling a friend about this. And they're like, they said, I could, he's like, he asked me, he said, you actually do that? I said, not every time, but a lot of times I, I really try to do that. He says, I can't do that. I said, can't or won't? Won't. Why won't you? Well, I, I feel like less than a man. You need a new definition of man, sir. How your, how's your son going to know how to do that? So all he's going to know is to throw and break and yell and anger? Those are necessary emotions, but they should never be destructive. Right? Um, use your words. Second, my kids would do things that would really frustrate me. and they, they would, I would ask them something. Communication. I'm going to get to the other ones really quick, so just hold on for just a second. I feel, I feel led on this, okay? It's up. <laughs> I, feel, I feel led on this. I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I think this will help someone. Um, I would try to get into my kid's world and I would ask them questions. Parents, can I give you this advice? When it comes to parenting, ask more questions and make less statements. What's going on? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Trying to teach them how to communicate. It's a product of the family. What you, what's going on? Why, why, why are you upset? I don't know. Nothing. Mm, not buying that. I got tired of hearing, I don't know. I felt like it was a, a trap that I would get like, sucked into the vortex of, I don't know. It's a very, very conversation-ending phrase. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
you, you could try to ask someone questions, just say, I don't know, and they can get out of it. So I finally, I was like, I'm, like, I'm going to get around this because I'm tired of being told I don't know. I think it's a crap answer. I, I do. I think it's a crap answer and a, a lot of times. And I, so I, one day, spur of the moment, what's going on? I don't know. And I said, I just like, can, I, you don't know or you don't want to think about it? Two different things. They would say, well, I don't want to think about it. Well, I want you to think about it, and then we need to discuss it. Communication is a product of the family. Um, values, what's important to you as a family. That's, what, that's, that's a family product. Emotional shelter. Combined with this, a psychological incubator. Um, our son Jacob was born um, premature, sort of. The placentas fused together, and his, his sister was getting more of the nutrients than he was, and he was born at four pounds, six ounces, and for the first seven days of his life, he was in an incubator. And the only way you could, you could get to him was, excuse me, the only way you could get to him was through these little rubber gloves that were through these circles. The only way you could get to him. Because the incubator was protecting him from the other environment, the other environmental things that were not helpful to him. This is a beautiful picture of family. Jacob's case was kind of emergency trauma, not great. But the flip side of that in the context of family is, a family is that. They're an incubator. They're a shelter, emotionally and mentally. We have a whole world that's driven by these buzzwords of safe space. Okay? Safe space is not, a, not meant for society as a whole to own. It's meant for families. It's meant for a human being to have a place where they can have emotional and mental shelter from the world, be strong, be protected, be capable. But when you designate that to a worldly, ungodly system, you come up with a lot of confusion and, and unhelpful things. In a kingdom family, it is a shelter for a person's mind and for their emotions so that they can learn how to process information and experiences and they can express those things in a healthy and positive way. The last two are self-concept and worth. Who you are and what you're worth comes from family. This is what a family produces. And, and, and the last one is our convictions slash beliefs. No matter what your family background is or was, these things were produced in you, positive, neutral, or negative. Remember, we're not talking about past today. We're talking about present and future. Let me talk to all the young people in here who are still under the supervision of your parents or guardian. They're going to get it wrong. Have grace on your parents. Parents, your kids are going to get it wrong. Have grace. Hold them responsible in a kind, unloving, firm way because you know what is being produced in them long term. My hope today was to give you these 10 things so that you could do this intentionally moving forward with kids, grandkids, kids that are you're raising that are not your natural born children that you're raising spiritually or from adoption or, or something of that matter. You can, you can look through these 10 things and say, this is what I'm, listen, it's not if you're producing them. You are producing these 10 things. They're being produced. They were produced in you and they'll be produced in others. So let's do it with the blueprint and have kingdom at the center of it. We can do this. We can change this. We can make a difference in the culture and the society in our own home. Have you ever felt like God doesn't hear you? That your voice hits the ceiling like the heavens are closed? I've felt that way too. Hello, my name is Josh Pennington and I would love to share with you how I navigated the dry seasons of life in my brand new book called When the Heavens Seem Closed. You can get this book anywhere that books are sold, online or at morelifechurch.com. I would love for you to plan a visit to worship with us any Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. at More Life Church.